Good morning, everyone, and welcome to Frontiers in Oncology. We have a special guest speaker today. It's my great pleasure to welcome Michael Lim. Mike is the new chair of neurosurgery, and Michael is uh, well known to many of us at Stanford. Uh, Michael grew up on the East Coast and uh, went to medical school at Johns Hopkins. He then came west to do an internship in surgery, followed by his residency in neurosurgery at Stanford, and then uh, went back to the East Coast and joined the faculty at Johns Hopkins for many years. And there he rose in the ranks, became a professor of neurosurgery, and at the same time built a very successful research program in studying brain tumors with a very special interest in understanding how immunotherapy can be applied to treat patients with brain tumors. And uh, he's just joined us in the last two weeks. He somehow has made it back to campus with his family, despite the pandemic, despite the fires, despite the smoke uh, coming at the worst possible time, but um, perhaps uh, evidence of his inability to be dissuaded um, was able to come in, in the last couple of weeks and, and is living on campus right now. So we're thrilled to have him here as a, as a cancer specialist in his new role as the chair of neurosurgery. And we're gonna learn from him today about uh, his perspective on immunotherapy for brain tumors. So welcome, Mike. Thank you, Dr. Artandi, for that very kind introduction. Um, I'm very thrilled and honored to be here. I'm very excited to be here at Stanford and um, very uh, and looking forward to working with uh, with everyone in the cancer center as well as in the university. Um, I, um, as as Dr. Artandi mentioned, I am a neurosurgeon and uh, I trained here at Stanford and then spent some time at, at Johns Hopkins uh, where I built the brain tumor immunotherapy program. And am back here now where um, I'm very interested in trying to um, uh, not only uh, continue to support and um, uh, our people in, in, in my department and in the cancer center and in the university, but also um, uh, interested would like very much to continue the work that we've done at Hopkins here um, in, in terms of developing immunotherapy for brain tumors. Um, before I begin, I want to um, you know, um, just um, show my relevant disclosures. I do have uh, and, uh, research and or trials supported by industry. Uh, we've also developed intellectual property around some of the ideas that are gonna be presented today. So I think many of us uh, have seen um, this changing landscape uh, in immunotherapy. It's truly a revolution. Um, when uh, these, particularly when checkpoint inhibitors came onto the scene um, and it was first in melanoma, uh, we've seen almost uh, uh, an acceleration of FDA approvals for different cancer types. And if you look at the news almost every other month, there's a new cancer indication that's approved. And um, the majority of these immunotherapies are based around this idea of what they call checkpoint molecules. Now, what checkpoint molecules are, are a second signal uh, after a T cell, uh, which is an immune cell, binds its cognate antigen or recognizes a specific antigen expressed either on an antigen presenting cell or a tumor cell. Once that T cell binds to its antigen, it needs a second signal to either turn the T cells on or turn the T cells off. And this is important because you can, as you can um, infer, uh, this protects us from things such as autoimmune diseases. However, cancers have kind of taken advantage of that to hide from the immune system and shut down the immune system. And so it turns out that if you disrupt this interaction, um, this blockage or the off signal, um, you can actually um, get turn on the T cells in a good subset of patients to actually induce uh, an immune response or an, uh, an anti-tumor immune response. And um, uh, there are a lot of drugs now that are out there that have basically block this interaction. I think you've seen things such as Optivo, Keytruda, and Finzi on commercials. And um, this industry is growing almost exponentially. And um, uh, it's now becoming a very important part of our cancer therapies. 
So as I mentioned before, we've seen uh, really since 2011, 2012, an acceleration of approvals for different types of cancers. And if you were to just take a step back and, and look at what's been going on for immunotherapy, there are kind of three main observations. Uh, first of all, in cancers that are responding to these immunotherapies, only about 20 to 30% of these tumors are responding. That means still the majority of these cancers do not respond to this immunotherapy. And regardless of whether or not you're a responder, patients can develop significant toxicities. And these toxicities can be uh, things such as pancreatitis, I mean, um, pneumonitis or pancreatitis or even uh, colitis, and they can be even life-threatening. And um, if you become one of those patients that um, have a response, a good portion of those patients become resistant uh, to the tumors. About We estimate as high as 25% of those tumors or cancers become resistant to the immuno-oncology. Um, one other um, important observation is that not all cancers uh, respond to uh, tumors too. So where are we with checkpoint inhibitors for gliomas? If we look at our glioma story, we, our story paralleled other cancers. We uh, initially looked at glioblastomas in mice, so our preclinical data suggested that some of these, check, um, these therapies would work. Peter Fecci in his lab, uh, Peter Fecci showed very nicely that uh, anti-CTLA-4, which is a checkpoint inhibitor, um, improves survival in mice with brain tumors. And, and Jing Zhang, when she who was in my laboratory, looked at uh, anti-PD-1. She's now an associate professor up at the University of Washington in Seattle. She also found that when you gave anti-PD-1, you could actually improve survival. Now, it's interesting that our story with PD-1 is that we happen to be, um, you know, being um, a clinician actually helped uh, with this finding. Um, it turns out that um, back in about 2010 or 2011, um, uh, PD-1 was, um, Hopkins was one of the first sites for PD-1 or anti-PD-1 therapy. And uh, back then, uh, the drug was called MDX-110. Uh, and so I remember seeing this patient in my clinic and um, uh, he presented with a, a brain met from his um, kidney cancer. And uh, I remember taking him to the OR thinking it was gonna be a routine case. And when I took his tumor out, um, and the PATH report came back, it came back as no active tumor, but just inflammatory cells. So I remember um, being piqued by that, uh, my, and my interest was piqued by that finding, and I followed that gentleman, because I usually see my patients every three months. And over the span of um, the next six to nine months, the tumors in his body started to melt away. And so um, uh, I became very interested in this, uh, this drug. And MDX-110, um, was from a drug a company called Medrex, which was then later accompanied by BMS, and um, that is now what's called Optivo today. And so with um, watching this gentleman um, and his course, we were able to um, bring that idea into gliomas, and that's kind of um, this idea of cross-fertilization. So we have preclinical data to suggest it worked. Um, then uh, Dr. Endum and Dr. Heimberger um, looked at the uh, ligand for PD-1, which is called PD-L1. And so um, it turns out that uh, glioblastomas and gliosarcomas actually express the PD-L1. So as, uh, as you know, time uh, was going on, there's preclinical data, there's um, uh, evidence that the target for this PD-1 exists in gliomas. People started giving anti-PD-1 and case reports were published across uh, North America. This was a case report from Toronto, which showed that um, this child who had glioblastoma actually had response to anti-PD-1. And there were other case reports. So as a result, it seemed like our story was going to be, you know, glioblastoma's story was going to be very similar to melanoma. Preclinical data, case reports, and um, Bristol-Myers Squibb launched a large phase three clinical trial in first-time recurrent GBMs. And uh, unfortunately, that trial came back negative, which was, you know, surprising to us. Uh, both in terms of overall survival and progression-free survival. BMS, at the, uh, at, shortly after starting that uh, recurrent study, launched a newly diagnosed study, um, and they gave it in uh, patients with unmethylated MGMT tumors as uh, well as methylated. And so the unmethylated readout came back, and the readout was negative for overall survival. 
And in the 548 safe, which was for methylated, the readout actually came back um, negative for progression-free survival, but the overall survival is not back yet. Now, progression-free survival for immunotherapies can be tricky because um, patients can have what's called pseudoprogression. Um, the inflammation can look like tumor recurrence. So uh, oftentimes with um, uh, patients on immunotherapy, we are... Um, uh, we look more towards the overall survival. So that data is not back. But regardless, um, the results were a bit disappointing for glioblastoma. It didn't turn out to be as what we thought. Um, on the other hand, um, there were other therapies that were going and patients with metastatic melanomas to the brain though, however, did have some responses. So some patients with brain tumors were responding. Um, the study um, in Stanford was part of that group. Uh, showed that you could actually improve overall survival, but uh, about um, over 50%, almost 57% of the patients developed uh, grade three or four toxicities for which a lot of patients had to be hospitalized. And so, you know, if you think about it, patients with brain metastases who are treated with radiation actually have the same, if not better, efficacy rates, um, but, you know, their side effects or toxicities are what they call um, radiation necrosis. Um, these are, uh, in this set, subset of patients, they're developing immune-related adverse events. It, um, you know, I, I think it's, it brings us to this crossroads where we really need to think about what's the best therapies for our patients with brain meds. But regardless, it was a positive trial. So now that the results have been negative, what are our next steps for glioblastoma? And there are many different approaches. Um, but if we were to summarize what's going on for checkpoint inhibitors, people have now pivoted to doing what's called combination approaches or what they call modulating the myeloid compartment, okay? And so, um, as I mentioned before, one of the things that we have found uh, over uh, looking at all these different types of tumors is that there are a certain group of tumors and, and uh, in a good way, the majority of these tumors do have some responses to immunotherapy and they're called hot tumors, but some tumors do not, and we classify them as cold. And prostate, pancreatic, and glioblastoma seems to fall into that cold category. Now, what I think is interesting is if you look at these tumors just kind of from a, um, you know, a, a 30,000 foot view, if you look at the tumors that are responding to immunotherapy, they are often tumors that originate from organs that have either exposure to the environment or to toxins, right? Our skin is exposed to ultraviolet rays, toxins in the air, um, and so they need, and bacteria, so they need to fight off infections or, or, or toxins all the time. Same with the lung and um, things like for the bladder and the kidney, they get, they get exposed to toxins because they filter out toxins. Um, but if you look at the ones that are not responding, the prostate, pancreatic, and, and pancreas and GBM, these are all from organs that are very nestled away in our brain, I mean, in our bodies that really have minimal exposure to either toxins or the outdoors. So it probably means that the immune system works differently uh, in those organs than it does in, in something like the skin. So if we take a step back and think about what, you know, why immunotherapy isn't working, you know, we kind of think about some of the um, theories on how the immune system interfaces with the tumor. There's this thing called the classic three E's hypothesis, elimination, equilibrium, and escape, right? There's a point where uh, the immune system can recognize uh, two, uh, cells that are going towards or becoming cancer, and they can eliminate them. But cancers eventually um, uh, acquire enough mutations to be in equilibrium with the immune system, and then they figure out a way to escape. And so if, you're, if they're escaping and you're thinking about resistance, you know, what do we think about when we talk about resistance? It's not one, it's probably not one mechanism and there's probably many mechanisms, but the way um, we think about it is that there's probably two main categories of resistance. One is intrinsic resistance. It's what the cancer cells have from the get-go that can just suppress an immune response. Things like checkpoint expression or the fast ligand and then there's adaptive resistance, which is kind of something that evolves over time. Um, these tumors have these mechanisms to acquire or upregulate certain defense mechanisms from the immune system. So as an example, melanoma has both low intrinsic and adaptive resistance. So that's why it seems like uh, checkpoints work and uh, vaccines work against melanoma. Not small cell lung cancer though has low intrinsic resistance, which is why um, checkpoint inhibitors work with them. 
But um, over time, these cancers do develop resistance and um, they have a high amount of um, resistance over time. And that's why it has a high amount of adaptive resistance. Prostate cancer, on the other hand, is high intrinsic resistance, which is why checkpoint inhibitors have, the results of the checkpoint inhibitor trials have been disappointing. But it has low adaptive resistance, which is why some of these uh, vaccine approaches have worked against it. Glioblastoma, unfortunately, has high adaptive and high intrinsic resistance. So what are some strategies that we're coming up with now to try to overcome the high adaptive and intrinsic resistance, right? So some people have said, well, let's go after the intrinsic stuff by doing combination IO therapies, like combination checkpoints. Um, other people have done kindling, which I'll talk about in a little bit. Some people have uh, looked at vaccines kind of as the adaptive arm. CAR T cells, um, Dr. Mackle and uh, Dr. Manji are doing a lot of work, and Dr. Thomas are doing a lot of work here with that, and uh, targeting the myeloid compartment. Uh, for today's talk, I'll probably not talk as much about the vaccines and CAR T cells, but I'll talk about the other three. So as, we, as I uh, mentioned before, glioblastomas probably have a different interface or a different way it uh, interacts with the immune system than perhaps the skin or the lung. And so if you look at, for example, checkpoint molecules, we talked about anti-PD-1 and anti-CTLA-4, and many people know about that. But there are many different checkpoint molecules, um, and that really highlights the fact that the immune system is complex. You need to be able to uh, modulate the intensity of an immune response as well as the location of an immune response. And there's probably a hierarchy that we don't fully understand. So back early on, when we, after we just, you, uh, had made the initial discovery with PD-1 and we saw the trial, we knew earlier on that, uh, or we had, uh, we thought that early, we thought that PD-1 may not work. We were able to go back to the uh, laboratory. And what we did is we took samples from patients from the OR and we started testing them for different checkpoint molecules. Um, as an example, uh, Magda, who's in my uh, postdoc in my lab, found that there was a checkpoint molecule called LAG3. It's not anti-LAG3, that's uh, the antibody, but just LAG3 um, and TIM3 in addition to PD-1. So um, it turns out that these other checkpoint molecules, initially we thought were going to be great targets, but there's also um, markers for a different phenomenon called exhaustion. And I think many people have heard of that term. If, if not, you know, if you have an exhaustion, it's this concept that T cells um, either through some immunosuppressive mechanism from the tumor or through chronic stimulation essentially become exhausted so that they can't carry out their cytotoxic function. They can't kill cancer cells. And it turns out that um, when these T cells become exhausted, they express checkpoint molecules like LAG3 and TIM3. So um, there was work that was done very nicely by Dr. Fetchy's lab, which showed that when you pulled out those T cells from GBMs, they were essentially exhausted because they couldn't uh, kill. And they were also co-expressing things like LAG3 and TIM3. And it turns out that these T cells that are floating in the blood get into the tumor and something, the tumor does something to cause upregulation of these checkpoint molecules. But, you know, sometimes in medicine we have, we tell, we look at stories, but one of the things that we thought was maybe this isn't an absolute phenomenon. Just because they express TIM3 or LAG3, that doesn't mean those T cells are done for. And so, um, you know, Sarah Harris Bookman um, and Demetrius in my laboratory looked at this idea of uh, exploring LAG3 a little further. And so LAG3 is a checkpoint molecule that's actually very involved in viral infection. Viruses upregulate this, and not only in the T cells, but also in some of these myeloid cells to essentially, um, you know, attenuate an immune response. And it turns out that um, Magda, uh, while she showed that those T cells uh, expressing LAG3 were present from flow cytometry, uh, Sarah Harris Bookman and, and Demetrius also looked at immunohistochemistry stains and showed that indeed these T cells that were in the tumor were expressing um, LAG3. And when they went back to our animal models for glioblastoma, they found that when these T cells were expressing both PD1 and LAG3, they were actually expressing very low levels of interferon gamma. Basically, these T cells were exhausted, did not have the ability to kill. But when they were not expressing PD-1 or LAG3, they'd express high levels of interferon gamma, suggesting that they could kill. So then what they did was we had a LAG3 knockout mouse. And when we gave LAG3 PD-1, we observed a, a fantastic uh, improvement in survival. Even LAG3 and PD-1 also showed uh, just the antibodies uh, showed improved survival. Okay. 
Another checkpoint molecule that we're looking at is something called CD137 or called 41BB. Um, what's interesting with this checkpoint molecule is that this uh, checkpoint molecule, when engaged, turns the T cells on. So it's like an accelerator, not a break. Okay. And Zineb Belkade in, in my laboratory looked at uh, CD137 or this thing called 41BB and showed that you can indeed improve survival. And in fact, um, when you gave it a combination, you were able to get uh, improved survival. Um, but if you gave it with radiation, again, it improved survival even more. But I'll discuss that radiation part in a little bit. So um, it turns out that you know, we were able to generate some interesting preclinical data that suggested that if you have LAG3 and PD-1, as well as um, uh, anti-CD-137 and CTLA-4, or we did it also with PD, uh, others have done it with PD-1, you could get a synergistic response that we thought perhaps this exhaustion isn't completely, um, I mean, these T cells are, are perhaps, or some of these T cells were salvageable. And so we went to uh, Bristol Myers Squibb and we uh, applied for a grant to the National Cancer Institute through something called the Adult Brain Tumor Consortium and uh, designed a trial for uh, testing the LAG3 and CD137 alone or in combination with PD1 in patients with first time recurrent GBM. And we did this across 14 sites in the US and this is results from the ASCO. I didn't uh, put this down here, but from ASCO. And we showed overall that the drugs were actually well tolerated. Um, the toxicities were not bad in these patients. And um, what was interesting was um, the LAG3 patients have continued to uh, fall off, but when we looked at the survival, there was um, this tail of LAG3 PD-1 patients that were surviving. And right now, five out of 16 patients are still alive. The median overall survival, if you looked at it just at, from, um, compared to historical survivals, was not improved, but we saw this um, tail. And so when we looked at, for example, one of the patients, this was one of the patients who received LAG3 PD-1. At the time of diagnosis, the patient had a, a very good, uh, an excellent resection, treated with chemotherapy and radiation, but then had a recurrence. So then he was started on our trial after he had another surgery, and there was uh, some tumor here that was left over. What was interesting is on the third cycle, this patient started to develop thyroiditis and uh, uh, when we looked at the scan, we thought, oh, it looks like the tumor's coming back. And through cycle three, cycle four, and cycle five, we persisted because the patient was clinically stable and um, I got the thyroiditis under control. And over time, you can see that this tumor regressed. And this person's, I think, over 30 months now out um, and doing well with no signs of recurrence. This was another person who was entered into our trial with recurrence. And initially, um, and you could see this tumor actually melting away. Um, and again, this person's also past 24 months surviving. Now, what's interesting is this person also had this pseudo progression where in the corpus callosum, which was far away from where the tumor was down here, there was this area that flared up and then went down. And so um, in both of these cases, there was this quote pseudo progression. Um, and uh, you would have actually said this patient had progression disease, but in fact, it actually, um, uh, both of them did well. Three out of the six are actually doing really well and they're living, um, you know, I think uh, past 24 months and I think past 28 months. What was really nice about being able being doing a phase one study through the NCI is that you could build in doing some uh, build in correlative studies. So what we did was we obtained tumor specimens from the patients um, from their first and, and uh, second resection if they had it and we drew blood from these patients and started studying them. Christina Jackson, who um, is a resident at Hopkins, was look, then looked at some of these samples. And the patients that were not responding, it looked like a cold tumor microenvironment. There were very few immune cells. And the responder, uh, it looked like there was actually a, a baseline level of uh, inflammation going on in the tumor. Um, what she also did was looked at T cell clones. So it turns out that there was a persistence um, of T cell, clone out, T cell clones in the uh, responder, um, whereas there was very few T cell clones in the non-responders, right? This is pretty marked. And of that, she was able to see about 21 clones versus two clones. Um, and what was also interesting in the responders is that these T cells, T cell, T cell clones increased over time, whereas in the non-responders, they decreased. And if you looked at how these T cells were expanding, it turns out that it took at least two doses of the LAG3PD1 before the T cells started to expand. 
What she then did was looked at the T cells themselves and saw that actually CD137 was co-expressed on these CD8 cells. And remember I told you CD137 is one of those markers for T cell activation. And so again, in the responder, there was a spike of T cells that were expressing CD137. And if you started following those cells, it was actually an increase in time for those T cells. So we thought that these are all potential biomarkers. Now the CD137 story was interesting. The CD137, if you looked at the median overall survival, bumped out to 14.3 months. We didn't have the long tail of survivors that we expected. Um, we're still analyzing the films and I'll have them for you. But our CD137 PD1 arm was very interesting. Now we were able to only um, recruit two patients into that trial because BMS um, shuttered the program. But what was interesting was that um, if you look at this patient, um, this tumor actually looked like it grew before it started to regress again. And this patient um, is as close to, um, it's past 28 months and doing well. And the other um, uh, CD137 PD1 patient went 18 months. And so um, they're, they're, uh, we're very excited about that result. So if you look, CD137 uh, actually had a very interesting signal. We have pushed out this median overall survival. Whereas with the PD-1 and LAG-3, we were able to not show a very impressive improvement in median overall survival, but we did see this tail of long-term survivors and these patients actually had a very nice response. So if you look, and we're shuttling between the lab and the clinic, so this is something where we had a question, we saw a clinical trial, the results came back negative, so we went back to the laboratory and looked for um, other ways that the immune system was suppressing or immune system was being suppressed. We identified candidate targets and went back um, into the lab and showed that this approach could potentially work in mice and then designed a, a, a clinical trial to make sure it was safe and then actually saw some signals. And with the LAG3 PD1, we're now gonna go to the Alliance for a phase two, three trial um, uh, and hopefully opening soon, which we're very excited. And with the CD137 PD1, uh, we're also working with potential companies to move to a larger trial. The second concept I want to talk to you about is something called kindling. And when I talk about kindling a systemic response, um, basically, if you want to start a big fire, you have to start with a little fire. Um, and so to get a systemic response, perhaps we want to do something um, local to, to ignite an immune response. And this is where this red mar uh, line came back from Jing, Jing that I told you about. We had this improved survival when we gave radiation, and, we, and, and Zineb found that with the CD137 and, and uh, CTLA4 and, and stereotype integrated surgery. So the idea for giving focused radiation just came from being in clinical practice. Um, early on in my career, I noticed that sometimes when we radiated these tumors, they uh, developed a very brisk uh, T2 response, which was an inf inflammatory response around the tumor. And uh, it happened from radiation. And it turns out that radiation can actually um, cause uh, inflammation uh, through either secretion of cytokines and uh, uh, spillage of antigens and um, actually increased antigen presentation. Now, what was interesting was that, you know, uh, we were very interested in looking at alternative methods of immunosuppression when PD-1 doesn't seem to play as big of a role. And so Dr. Hammerman um, published an interesting paper uh, back in 2015 and it's a very complex side, but basically the gist of the side is that um, what they did was they took tumors and they made it resistant to PD-1 and then dissected out the um, mechanisms of what caused the next, I mean, dissected out the immunosuppression that was caused when they became PD-1 resistance. And these lung cancers actually upregulated TIM-3 to uh, evade the immune system. And so we became very interested in TIM-3 because we found it in our GBM samples and, um, and because of this paper. And so it turns out that um, Jennifer Kim, when she did the uh, work, in, when she worked in my lab, looked at TIM3 PD1 expression during tumor progression. And it turns out that over time, um, immune cells uh, in cancer, the, specifically the T cells, it co-expressed TIM3 PD1 over time, and it's independent of volume. And it was uh, increased in all compartments. And so it suggested that this target existed. And it turns out TIM3 is another important molecule import, uh, that's involved in viral infections and um, is expressed on the T cells, as well as um, macrophages and dendritic cells to turn off an immune response. And so Jenny um, 
again looked with immunohistochemistry, showed that found that the majority of the patients that we studied had T cells that were expressing TIM3. And so uh, came up with this idea of testing TIM3 and PD1 and focus radiation. Kind of went back to this algorithm that we had shown earlier. And so here's our animal, small animal radiator uh, research platform they call the SARP. These uh, collimators are two millimeters. It was developed by John Wong at, at Hopkins. And it turns out that um, when you give TIM3, gave TIM3 and PD1, you got a very nice synergistic response, but 100% of the animals got, uh, were cured when you gave the TIM3, PD1, and stereotactic surgery, and she did this multiple times. So we're, of course, very excited about these results. We went to um, uh, Novartis, and um, uh, they were able to um, support us for a small clinical trial. And we have this trial running, actually, at Johns Hopkins and at Stanford. Um, or hopefully we'll be running at Stanford uh, as, as we collaborate with our um, medical oncologists and radiation oncologists. And so um, uh, patients with first-time recurrent GBM or second-time recurrent GBM are going to be given TIM3 and PD-1, as well as stereotactic rate of surgery. Another idea for what we call kindling is chemotherapy. Um, oftentimes when you watch people in the community, um, you can see that uh, um, you know, patients who have had chemotherapy uh, are wearing masks before all this COVID. Um, and it turns out that the immune system is affected um, by certain types of chemo. And so this chemotherapy causes indiscriminate toxicity and kills off immune cells. And we thought that actually handicaps an immune response. So Dr. Henry Brem, who was my chairman at Hopkins, um, developed these Gliadel wafers with Dr. Langer. And um, these are, Gliadel wafers are FDA approved. They were uh, approved back in um, the late 1990s. And in essence, what they do is they deliver chemotherapy only uh, locally to where the tumor cells are. And so we thought that if you give chemotherapy locally, you could avoid the systemic toxicity and maybe even improve um, uh, an anti-tumor response. So our idea was very similar. It's this idea of kindling with combined with the immunotherapy to cause a systemic response. And um, Demetrius Matthias and Jennifer Kim uh, looked at this question. So when they gave the local chemotherapy plus anti-PD-1, they showed a very nice synergistic response. And these mice were essentially vaccinated against the tumor. If you gave the mice local, I mean, systemic chemotherapy and PD-1, it did not improve survival um, significantly, or it did not actually improve survival. And these mice that got systemic chemotherapy also come to their disease if they were challenged. Um, we did this also with um, not just the BCNU, which is in the gliadel wafers, but also temozolomide, and, and uh, again, saw this very nice synergistic response. Now, uh, what was interesting is what we did is we then took these animals that um, got systemic chemo and um, um, wait, waited for their uh, immune counts to uh, recover and then rechallenged them with their tumor, like simulated someone getting a tumor recurrence. But when we gave anti-PD-1 in that setting, these mice all still died. We were not able to rescue them. And so it suggests that um, with certain types of chemo like BCNU and temozolomide, even though your white blood cells counts drop and then recover, your immune system is not the same. It turns out that there are these things called memory T cells and they don't recover, at least in the mice. And that suggests that um, we may need to think our strategies for sequencing uh, immunotherapies. As a result, um, we initially had a, a uh, funding for a trial to do this uh, with BMS and Arbor. Uh, it's currently on hold and um, we may be using a different vendor, but uh, we're going to test this hypothesis where we're going to give local chemotherapy instead of systemic chemotherapy to patients with glioblastoma and combine it with radiation. Another idea for kindling is this idea of neoadjuvant PD-1. Um, so this neoadjuvant idea is, is um, going across uh, many different cancer types. So basically this idea is to give the immunotherapy before you give surgery to patients. And so this is Dr. Tim Klaus's study. Um, and when uh, they did this uh, for patients with glioblastoma, they showed actually improved survival in patients who received neoadjuvant PD-1. So if you gave the PD-1 before they got surgery, they did better. And it suggests that maybe there's some sort of kindling effect that was augmented with this. They also showed, um, this was the same survival curve in different colors, that um, you actually had increased T cell clonality, so you were able to induce an immune response. Um, and uh, there was a companion paper uh, published by Dr. Malero out of Europe, and they also did um, this neoadjuvant, and they showed that some of these T cell clones expanded. 
Now, if you look uh, across other tumor types, this was studied by Dr. Patrick Ford. I'm sorry that the um, uh, reference fell off, but this was Dr. Patrick Ford's uh, paper uh, in the New England Journal. And what they did was they um, looked at the idea of giving neoadjuvant PD-1 to patients with lung cancer. And unlike glioblastoma, where you really shouldn't wait more than a week or two bef um, before uh, operating, you were able to wait a month. So if someone came with lung cancer, they were able to give the PD-1 uh, a month before the surgery. And what was interesting is when they followed these T cells, the T cells actually um, had this rapid increase in um, number of T cells, in the, at least in the bloodstream of these patients with lung cancer. And so it's probably an indiscriminate expansion. And then what happens at two weeks out or two weeks before surgery is that you actually see a contraction of these T cells. And it's probably because of two reasons. One, the, the T cells that are not relevant to fighting the cancer it, um, probably start to quiet down. And the T cells that are relevant for fighting the cancer are probably going into the tumor. And then when um, through um, what's called a manifest assay that was developed by Drew Pardola and Hopkins, they were able to find some of the antigens that these T cells were recognizing. And what was really surprising is that um, most cases there was only three or four antigens that these T cells were recognizing. It wasn't a ton, you know, like 12 or 15, but three. Uh, and sometimes um, uh, these clones were recognizing the same protein, it was just in a different uh, region of the protein. So this suggests that something like a CAR T cell approach could be very, um, you know, uh, feasible because um, you may only need to develop a cocktail of three or four CAR T cells to perhaps kill off uh, certain types of cancer. In neurosurgery, other uh, examples of kindling, people are trying what's called laser ablation in immunotherapy and focused ultrasound in immunotherapy. One other thing I want to talk to you about is another approach that people are thinking about is um, something called uh, affecting the metabolism. It turns out that, for example, glutamate um, is a neurotransmitter in the tumor microenvironment, but glioblastoma has actually increased glutamate in the tumor. And in the past, people thought the pathogenesis was that the glutamate increases the tumor, um, it increased glutamate concentrations on the tumor, causes excitotoxicity, and causes neurons to die which leaves some space for tumors to grow uh, unabated. We had this hypothesis that excess glutamate could actually be bad for T cells and um, could actually make those T cells uh, turn off. And so if that happens, then the tumor cells can proliferate without interference. Um, but there was also a very interesting paper that was um, a seminal paper that was published by Dr. Manji, who showed that, um, in fact, uh, these increased levels of neurotransmitters can actually stimulate cancer cells. These cancer cells actually have these receptors that can um, take it as pro-tumorigenic. So um, it seems like there's probably multiple levels of, um, of uh, pathogenesis with having high levels of glutamate. So we are working with the company, uh, Dr. Manji is heading this, where she's looking at a drug called BHV from uh, drug from um, uh, uh, I mean, a drug called BHV, which uh, in, basically works by um, upregulating this thing called the EAAT, which is a um, basically a transporter for glutamate. It essentially vacuums the glutamate out of the extracellular space and, and the synapses. And so um, it upregulates this uh, receptor to basically drop the glutamate levels. And um, Rav, uh, Ravi Medikanda, who's uh, in my lab, uh, was a medical student, looked at the idea of uh, how um, glutamate concentration can affect an immune response. It turns out that if you actually block this uh, BHV, you can actually, uh, I mean, decrease glutamate concentrations, you can actually um, decrease the number of Tregs, which are T cells that essentially turn off an immune response. He did it with something called microdialysis, and it turns out that um, these, this drug does effectively work and decreases the concentration of glutamate in the brain. And when he's looked at the specimens, um, you could actually uh, increase the number of T cells that come into the tumor once you give this BHB drug. He then went and did a survival assay and showed that um, when you give anti-PD-1 in the, the drug, you can actually improve survival. And when you got rid of the T cells, you abrogated its effect, so it is really an immune-related, uh, immune-driven effect. So as you can see, um, there are many different ideas for kindling and um, if you can kind of take a bigger step, the, what we've been doing in the lab has been really translational. We've been 
Um, we found other interesting molecules. And so what we've been doing, able to do is to try to take some of those findings from the lab and push them into clinical trials. And that's been uh, something that we've been very interested in doing to try to, again, help our patients with glioblastoma. So um, one last thing I want to talk about is something called the myeloid compartment. Um, and you, you've heard this term, and myeloid is this very loose term, but a lot of people talk about it. And I think we have to be a little bit more precise in myeloid, and I'll talk about that in a second. So, um, you know, um, Christopher Jackson, who was a medical student with me, then a resident and now on faculty at Johns Hopkins, uh, worked in my lab for, um, with me. And uh, when he was in the lab, he, um, we were thinking about um, patients with um, brain metastasis. And it turns out that, um, you know, for example, this was a patient who had a brain metastasis, did well from surgery, went home from surgery within 48 hours. But back in 2000, um, you know, 2010, 2007, um, uh, what happens is uh, these, um, the uh, patients uh, did not live for more than a year. And it turns out if you look at the staging for patients with melanoma, once it goes to the brain, the survival drops to four to five months. And this is not unique to melanoma, breast cancer, lung cancer. These are, um, it's a very poor prognostic sign. And so, um, Chris asked this question, why do patients who develop brain metastasis have such poor prognosis? And so he had this um, hypothesis that perhaps having brain metastasis affected the immune response. And it was maybe more immunosuppressive to have a tumor in the brain. It's a location question. So what he did was he took B16 um, ova uh, cells. So basically these B16 cells are melanoma cells and they express a peptide called ova, which is a chicken peptide. It's unique. It's not expressed in mice normally. And so um, you can then get mice that have uh, T cells that are designed that have T cells that are specifically targeting ova, so they're genetically modified, and so you basically have an antigen-specific uh, model. And what you can do, or what he did, was then took these tumors and implanted in the brain and into the periphery of, of mice. He then adoptively transferred those antigen-specific T cells and then pulled them out after a few days. And what he found was very interesting. So. If you look at the uh, animals that had tumors in the periphery, like in the flank, and compared them to the animals that had tumors in the brain, there were T cells that were being actively deleted. Okay, And uh, furthermore, if you looked at those T cells that were in the brain, compared them to the tumors that were in the flank, for example, this is called the CS CFSE stain. CFSE is a stain, essentially. And you can imagine you take a cell and you stain it, and then every time the cell divides, you'll see a little change or dilution of the, um, of the dye. So each of these little streaks up here that are individual means that these cells are dividing. And the um, y-axis is interferon gamma. So you can see when you have a tumor in the periphery, the T cells are able to still divide and they express interferon gamma. However, when you had a tumor in the brain, they were not dividing and they did not express interferon gamma. It also turns out that the brain tumors can actually direct T cells away. This was Peter Fetchy's work, which showed that if you have a tumor in the brain, um, you can actually, uh, these T cells are actually sequestered away into the bone marrow. And Oren Block uh, showed with his clinical trial that when he looked at uh, patients' blood samples, he found something called circulating macrophages, which are a myeloid cell. And these macrophages were expressing PDL1. And if you uh, co cultured them with T cells, it was shutting the T cells off. So, in essence, when you had a tumor in the brain, you were causing global immunosuppression. And so you caused deletion of antigen specific T cells. So Basically, T cells that can kill the cancer are either killed off, turned off, or directed away. And um, it turns out that um, macrophages are even um, uh, circulating to the blood that are um, turning off the uh, immune response. So we had Chris then asked this question, well, what is causing the global immunosuppression? And so, um, as I mentioned before, there's multiple levels of global immunosuppression at the bone marrow. Uh, cervical lymph nodes and um, uh, just throughout the body. And so what he did was he looked at TGF beta levels and it turned out that TGF beta levels were very high in the mice that had brain tumors. And he traced it back to what he thought were myeloid cells, which he thought were particularly macrophages in this situation. And so what he did was he blocked TGF beta. And when he blocked the TGF beta, you were able to get that, um, the T cells to start replicating again and activating. Um, 
So, you know, this then brought up our question, myeloid cells, and everyone talks about myeloid cells, but it turns out that there was, if you look at patients with tumor samples of glioblastoma, there are lots of these myeloid cells, and they're particularly macrophages and microglia. And there are very few T cells in comparison to, which is in stark comparison to melanomas, which have lots of T cells. So these myeloid cells are actually more than likely my microglia and macrophages. Um, but um, so right now, many people are looking to target the myeloid population. And so what does it mean to target macrophages, for example? To, to me, I, we, um, you know, I think about it in three ways. First of all, these myeloid cells are actually what they call immunosuppressive. They actually uh, are what they call an M2 phenotype. They have the ability to turn off an immune response. So um, one way to target myeloid cells is to stop them from being M2s and reprogram them to become M1s, which facilitate uh, in inflammation. They also are responsible for antigen presentation. So you want to activate antigen presentation and you want to facilitate migration so that the good uh, myeloid cells come in. And so, for example, this is a, a, what they call a TAM, tumor-associated macrophage. And if we look at it, there are many different therapies that are out, CSF1 inhibitors, IDO inhibitors. A lot of people are looking at this. And so if you give one of these drugs, our thoughts are that you convert it to an M1 phenotype, then um, they're able to do antigen presentation. And then these cells are then able to go into the deep cervical lymph nodes and do antigen presentation. And then these T cells can then go up to the tube, back up into the brain and into the tumor to kill the cancer cells. And so right now it's, it's, a, it's a pretty big task and a lot of people are looking at different approaches to targeting these myeloid cells. Now, some encouraging um, suggestions that this is the right strategy. This was a slide shared to me by Tokogen. Tokogen uh, developed a virus that's supposed to kill cancer. Initially, they had used this to, um, the virus to be a definitive therapy, but they had noticed that um, some of these patients were actually getting very good responses. And as they started studying them, they uh, realized that it was an immune mediated response. And it turns out that viruses actually are cleared by macrophages, um, which are myeloid cells. And it turns out that um, viruses activate these uh, macrophages through what they call toll-like receptors. And so Tomas Garzon Mufti, when he was in my lab, looked at this pathway, kind of the viral pathway, and he looked at something called poly-IC, and poly-IC um, activates that toll-like receptor. And when he gave it with PD-1, he showed that, again, he had improved survival. He looked at other uh, candidates, such as CSF1, arm FLT3, and others, like Dr. Wainwright, have been looking at IDO and combining it with checkpoint inhibitors. Now, one of the things that... Um, uh, was interesting was that um, these IDO inhibitors or these uh, myeloid inhibitors didn't would not work by themselves. They needed these checkpoint molecules to kind of finish off the job. And as I showed earlier, um, these uh, myeloid cells go into the lymph nodes to do antigen presentation, but then they need to go back, uh, those T cells that are uh, then need to go back up into the brain. But it turns out that a lot of these myeloid cells are, at least Tomas found that are, suggestions that these myeloid cells were expressing PD-L1. So they weren't completely reversed and you needed the PD-1 to facilitate the final activation. It was almost like PD-1 was the second step, but it didn't work as a first step. And so, um, you know, we've been, uh, we initially worked uh, with certain companies to try to do uh, precision guided therapy. We had a trial that was uh, running uh, for a while at Hopkins where we gave um, what we tried to make it a little bit more precise uh, with precision medicine. What we did was we took tumors out of patients. We actually stained the tumor samples for various uh, immune molecules. Um, and then um, if they expressed, for example, IDO, they got anti-PD-1 and anti-IDO. What was interesting is the PD-1, that we started the PD-1 right away, so people were getting immunotherapy. And so um, I think that this is kind of the next generation of um, clinical trials. Finally, as an aside, we have not only been looking at glioblastomas, chordomas have also been of interest to us. Um, this uh, Demetrius Matthews looked at the idea of uh, maybe using checkpoint inhibitors for PD-1. He found that PD-L1 existed on chordomas. And then what he did was he created a humanized mouse model. So basically, we were able to take uh, you know, human chordomas and then take the mice and give them uh, adoptive, you know, almost like a bone marrow transplant of, of the hu uh, human immune system. 
And when he did that, he showed that when he gave anti-PD-1, it could actually improve, uh, improve survival in these mice. And so um, he's done other preclinical work to show that this, again, is a feasible strategy. And um, we were able to bring this to a clinical trial based uh, on support from the Cordoma Foundation. As I mentioned before, we thought that stereotactic radio surgery would be very helpful. And in conjunction with Dr. Josh Yamada at Memorial Sloan Kettering, we came up with a clinical trial for patients with advanced chordoma where we're giving them anti-PD-1 therapy or anti-PD-1 with SRS. And the primary objective of that trial was to, of course, do safety, but as secondary objectives, we hope to see survival and radiographic responses. Um, we are going to be presenting that data soon, but um, you know, so far we've actually had some very good results with the patient with that trial. We've seen some tumors responding, and so um, you know, we hope to open that trial here at Stanford also, because um, uh, again, chordomas are a very tough disease. If you can't get a non-block resection, it's very hard to cure, um, and there's not really any good therapies. So, you know, as we mentioned before, with studying the tumor microenvironment is not a static process. Just because you took one snapshot doesn't mean that uh, you have all the answers. We have really great tools, but things such as heterogeneity and time uh, complicate the fact, uh, complicate our therapeutic strategies. And even if um, we start getting responses, we have to anticipate resistance mechanisms that are coming up. And, and so we should be in a continual cycle um, uh, to try to um, evolve our strategies for patients with tumors, very much like other, uh, like with targeted therapies. So, you know, in conclusion, the immuno initial immunotherapy results have been disappointing for glioblastoma. It turns out that we think that you have to think about the mecha resistance mechanisms, both with intrinsic and adaptive uh, mechanisms. And so to be thoughtful, you want to come up with strategies that address both. Um, and combinations uh, approaches that have been using IO therapies, um, as well as combining with things such as stereotactic radio surgery and or addressing myeloid cells are currently underway, but there's certainly a lot more things that are coming down the, down the pike. Um, we also, um, I think, need to anticipate uh, resistance to immunotherapy uh, in our strategy, just because we don't see a great response doesn't mean that these tumors are still not evolving to some sort of immunologic pressure. So with that, I want to acknowledge that um, I've been able to work with a lot of great uh, folks over the years. Uh, Christopher Jackson's actually not a med student anymore. He's uh, got his own lab, so he should be over here. But uh, I've been having the privilege to work with a lot of bright students um, and collaborators over the years. Um, we have an amazing clinical trials group. Um, you know, uh, I feel very lucky to be able to work with you know, uh, you know, great uh, oncologists and medical oncologists um, throughout the country as well as at Hopkins and Stanford, um, as well as my colleagues in neurosurgery. Um, you know, I want to highlight that these immunotherapy programs, we started one of the, the first brain tumor immunotherapy program at Hopkins when I started. I had one tech and $100,000. Now we're able to build this into this large uh, group of, and um, we've been able to get buy-in. And, um, and I feel very excited and, and privileged to be now working with the Stanford Immunotherapy Program and the, and the oncologists here. Um, with that, I want to acknowledge the funding that um, has come through the years to help um, get this work done. And uh, again, want to thank you for your time.